Here's Nancy demoss Walgamuth with a key question. Do the words that come out of your mouth reveal that your heart is fully dedicated, surrendered to God? Are you filling your mind and your heart with the Word of God so that what comes out of your mouth will be messages from Him? This is the Revive Our Hearts podcast with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, author of Holiness, The Heart God Purifies. For February 5th, 2024, I'm Dana Gresh. This version of Take My Life and Let It Be is from Nancy's piano album called Be Still. During our current series, also called Be Still, Nancy's digging into the rich meaning of the hymns she plays on that album. Here's Nancy. I so enjoyed recording this. It's taken me back to my childhood and growing up years to uh, be playing the piano and playing these great hymns, many of which you don't hear very often today. And uh, some of you have been asking, will the music the piano music be available so that others can play it? And the answer is yes, it will be. That's available at reviveourhearts.com. There are different kinds of hymns that have different kinds of thrusts and emphasis, but some of the hymns that I most enjoy are those that express a heart of consecration. They're sometimes called aspiration, songs or hymns of longing, expressing to the Lord our desire to be closer to Him, to know Him, to walk with Him, to be consecrated fully to Him. And that's one of the ones that we want to look at today. Well, last week we talked about Frances Ridley Havergal and her great hymn, Like a River Glorious. Frances was a committed believer. She was serving the Lord. But when she got to her mid-30s, she felt that something was still missing in her Christian life. And it was then that she discovered a little book called All for Jesus. It talked about the importance of allowing Jesus to reign over every nook and cranny of our lives. And as she read that book, Frances came to a fresh and complete consecration of herself to Christ as Lord. Years later, she wrote of that experience, and she said it was on Advent Sunday, December 2nd, 1873, I first saw clearly the blessedness of true consecration. I saw it as a flash of electric light, and what you see, you can never unsee. There must be full surrender before there can be full blessedness. Did you get that? There must be full surrender before there can be full blessedness. Well, a short time later, Francis spent several days visiting in a home with several other people. There were 10 people staying in that home, and some of them were unconverted. Some of them were not walking with the Lord. And Francis prayed, Lord, would you give me everyone in this house for you? And she began witnessing to them and one-on-one challenging them with the claims of Christ and ministering to them. And before she left, each one of them had made a commitment of their lives to Christ. Well, on the last night of her five-day visit, she was too excited to sleep because of what God was doing in all these people's lives. And she stayed up most of the night writing what has become known as this great consecration hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Now, this term consecration or consecrated is not one that is part of our everyday language today. Sadly, it needs to be more a part of our language. But it's a concept that's often found throughout the scripture. To be consecrated, we talk about offerings being consecrated to the Lord in the Old Testament. Many times the scripture says, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do great things. Consecration, it means to declare or set apart as holy, sacred, to dedicate solemnly to a service or a goal, to sanctify. It means to dedicate one's life, one's time, one's possessions, whatever, to a specific purpose. And consecration is not just something you fall into or that happens to us by osmosis. It's an intentional, deliberate, continual act of offering up our lives as a sacrifice to the Lord. We want to be set apart for His kingdom purposes. Now, I think sometimes we have this image that consecration, it sounds like such an old fuddy-duddy word, and that this is just for a few really holy people. 
who are specially consecrated to the Lord. You know, people like me who just teach the Bible and live in their little holy conclave or whatever. But consecration is not just for a select few. It's for every believer. It ought to start at the point of our salvation at which we say, Lord, I am yours. You gave yourself for me. I give myself to you. And as we consecrate ourselves and our lives and our stuff and our families and everything to the Lord, we're just giving back to him what he has given us. It all belongs to him. It's not ours. And we're just acknowledging, Lord, I'm yours. It's all yours. So consecration is both an obligation because it all belongs to him. My money, it's all his. So I consecrate it to him to be used for his purposes. But it's not just an obligation. It's also a great privilege to give back to God what rightly belongs to him. So in consecration, we see love's demand and we see love's delight. It's required of us, but it's a privilege to give ourselves to God. And I think in this whole thing of consecration, there's both point and process, as is true with other aspects of the Christian life. Here's how Frances Havergal said it. She said, full consecration may be in one sense the act of a moment, a point in time. That's what happened to her when she read that book, All for Jesus. She came to a fresh point of consecration of her life to the Lord. It may be the act of a moment. And in another sense, consecration may be the work of a lifetime, a process, an ongoing daily process. She says it must be complete to be real. And yet, if real, it is always incomplete. We're offering up ourselves completely to the Lord, but there's always more to offer up to the Lord. It's incomplete. It's a point of rest and yet a perpetual progression. Point and process. Well, I want to take the moments we have together today and walk through with you the lines of this great consecration hymn and do it by means of asking some questions so that we can make personal these lines of this hymn and more importantly, make personal our own consecration to the Lord. Now, I'm just reading or sharing with you in this session selected questions from a larger piece we have available at reviveourhearts.com. It's a PDF. You can print it out. It takes each line of this hymn and it asks some questions to help you make it practical. So it's something you could take and meditate on, use it in your quiet time, perhaps share it with others in a small group or a study group so that we can say, is every part of my life consecrated to the Lord? For example, we take the first line, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. And here are a couple questions to think about. Have you made a volitional, unconditional, lifetime surrender of your life to Christ? That's what it means to be a Christian, to fully, wholly belong to him. Is that true of you? And are you seeking to live out that surrender on a daily basis? Consciously consecrating, Lord, take my life. Let it be consecrated, Lord, to you. It belongs to you. This is the life you've given me. I give it back to you. Is that your heart? And then the next line, she says, take my moments and my days. Let them flow in endless praise. You know, it's one thing to say, I give you my life, but then our life is composed of various parts. And so she goes through and details more specifically what we're consecrating or offering up to the Lord, dedicating to him. And the first thing is my time. Is your time consecrated to the Lord? Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise, unending praise. So here's something to think about. Do you live with a conscious realization that all your time belongs to God, all of it? Or have you merely reserved a portion of your time for the, quote, spiritual category of your life? Yeah, I'll give the Lord an hour on Sunday morning. We'll give the Lord, you know, three minutes to pray before a meal or maybe family devotions, but this time that's mine. I need my time. Now, we wouldn't say it that way, but are you consciously giving up to the Lord, dedicating to him your time, realizing that it all belongs to him, your moments and your days. Here's another question. Are you purposeful and intentional in your use of time, seeking to invest your days and your moments in ways that will bring glory to God? Do you even think about that? That's part of living a consecrated life, 
our time being consecrated to him. And then she talks about consecrating to God the members of our body. She says, take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. I thought about that phrase while I was recording this, playing the piano, and my prayer was, Lord, take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. This is not for me. This is not about me. This is for you. This is because I love you and I want to declare my love for you. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. And take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee, she says. Have you yielded the members, parts of your body to God as instruments of righteousness? As Romans 6 says, your hands, your feet, your eyes, your every part of you used for God and his purposes. Do you use the members of your body to express the love of Christ to others? Let them move at the impulse of thy love. Your hands can be used for serving others or for tender touch for your children. Are you using the members of your body to express the love of Christ to others? And here's another question. Are there any members of your body, eyes, ears, hands, feet, mouth, that are being used for selfish purposes or even to sin against God? Paul says in Romans, this should not be. You belong to God if you are in Christ. Let your members be presented, dedicated, consecrated to God as a living sacrifice, as instruments of righteousness. And then she says, take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Remember, Frances was a talented musician, and she could have gotten a lot of self-acclaim and self-glory, but she said, no, I'm going to use my voice only to bring glory to my king. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. How about your tongue? Have I been consecrated to the Lord? Are you consecrating it, dedicating it daily? That's what the psalmist was doing when he prayed, Lord, set a watch before the door of my mouth. Don't let me say anything unholy. Do the words that come out of your mouth reveal that your heart is fully dedicated, surrendered to God? Are you filling your mind and your heart with the word of God so that what comes out of your mouth will be messages from him? That's what she's saying. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Where do you get messages from God? You open this book. You get into it and you get it into you and you get so filled with scripture that when you get challenged or when you speak or when you're pressured, and I don't just mean when you're on the platform speaking, it's easy to speak the truth of God then, but what about when you're under pressure, when you're being pushed, when somebody at work is pressuring you because of your faith or when your child is getting on your nerves or your mate's getting on your nerves or you're getting on your nerves, what comes out of your mouth? Is it messages from God because your heart is so filled with his word? Do you intentionally use your tongue to speak of Christ and to encourage others in their walk with God? Take my lips, let them be filled with messages from the consecrated tongue so that I'm speaking of Christ, looking for opportunities as I'm out and about doing business, shopping, talking with people that I run into, working with vendors or other staff or family members. Do I use my tongue to speak of how wonderful Christ is and to point others to a relationship with him, to encourage them in their walk with him. Well, then she talks about consecrating our possessions to God. She says, take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Does that remind you of a story in the scripture where the widow had just a little bit of money left couple of coins. She gives every last thing she has. Francis says, I want my money, all my stuff, my possessions. It's it's all yours. I don't want to hold any of it back for myself. Toward the end of her life, Francis Havergal wrote to a friend and she said, take my silver and my gold, that hymn she'd written years earlier. It now means shipping off all my ornaments, her um, jewelry including a jewel cabinet, which is really fit for a countess, to the Church Missionary Society. She says, I retain only a brooch for daily wear, which is a memorial of my dear parents, also a locket. She said, I had no idea I had such a jeweler's shop. Nearly 50 articles are being packed off. 
And you think, well, if you're giving all that up, you're giving it away, you're sending it for the money to be invested in missions, she sent it to the Church Missionary Society, say, you know, that would be really hard. But she ended this letter saying, I don't think I need to tell you I never packed a box with such pleasure. There's freedom that comes from releasing our grip, releasing our grasp and saying, Lord, it's all yours. Now, does that mean God wants you to go home today and pack up all your jewelry, everything, or your silverware, or your china, or your furniture, or whatever, and send it all to the mission field? If God puts that on your heart, you'll find great joy in doing it. But it doesn't mean that God will lead everyone to give in exactly the same way. It does mean that in our hearts, we understand it all belongs to Him and that we are just stewards of it. If he lets us use it, it's for his glory, for his purposes, but not for our own good. It's for his good and his glory. And it also means that if he puts his finger on something and his spirit prompts us, you need to give that. I'm just, again, in what is just a perpetual process of decluttering and just go through my house and realize how many things I have, clothing items I have, things I don't wear, things I don't need, things that are just sitting there and give them declutter. There's such a freedom that comes, as the Lord prompts, from giving stuff to be used for kingdom purposes, not just holding on to it. I might need that in 40 years. Well, you might not live 40 years, and then your children are going to have to go through all this stuff and figure out what to do with it. Do it now as God prompts. So the question is, do you give generously and sacrificially and gladly to the Lord's work and to others in need? And are you a wise steward of the material resources that God has entrusted to you? Take my silver, take my gold, not a mite would I withhold. And then she talks about consecrating her mind to the Lord. Take my intellect, of which she had a considerable one. Remember we talked about how bright she was and how many languages she knew and all the scriptures she memorized. She had an amazing intellect. But she says, take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose consecrated to you. You may say, well, I don't have much of an intellect. I'm not that bright. I can hardly speak English, much less all those other languages. What would I have to give God what you do have? Are you bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ? Are your thoughts consecrated to the Lord? So many of us as women are plagued with thoughts that are not according to the word of God. Thoughts of self-loathing, thoughts of pride, thoughts of fear, thoughts of anxiety. Take my mind, Lord. Take my thoughts. Let them be consecrated to you. Are you exercising your mind to get to know God and his word better? reading, thinking, applying yourself, or are you frittering away your life with computer games or with pursuits that may be fun but have no eternal value? Are you using your mind to get to know God and his word? Do you habitually think about things that are just and pure and lovely and of good report and virtuous and praiseworthy, as Philippians 4.8 tells us? Or do you spend a lot of time thinking about things that are unwholesome, or negative, or impure, or just empty, vain. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. And then she says, take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Does that remind you of what our Savior said? Lord, not my will, but yours be done. So do you seek to know and to do the will of God in the practical daily matters of life? And when you read the scripture or you hear it proclaimed, are you quick to say, yes, Lord, and do what it says? Or do you just keep going your own way, doing your own thing? Is there anything God has shown you to be his will that you've been neglecting or you've been refusing to obey? Take my will, make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. And then take my heart, my affections, Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. What about letting Jesus have your affections, your heart? Letting him reign and rule over your emotions. Are you allowing him to rule over your affections, your emotions, your responses? Are your desires, your appetites, your longings under Christ's control? My heart, it shall be thy royal throne. Consecrating my heart to him. And then this whole matter of relationships. 
She says, take my love, my Lord. I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take my love, who I love, what I love, how I love, my relationships, my friendships. Lord, I pour it all out to you. As I mentioned, Frances Havergal never married, but she did have a number of marriage proposals. There was one man that she loved deeply, but he didn't share her faith in Christ. And she knew that she couldn't obey the Lord and marry an unbeliever. So she turned it down. She said, take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Do you love God more than every other earthly relationship? Now, how do you know? You know, it's a daily thing, right? Saying, Lord, do you mean more to me? Do you matter more to me than any earthly relationship? Have I made an idol out of any person? I talk with some women who so long to see their husband get right with God that he has become an idol. Or who so long for their children to be restored from being prodigals that those children have become an idol. Yes, you pray. Yes, you long. But do you long for Christ more than you even long for a godly husband or for godly children? Realizing that God wants the hearts of your mate and your children and your friends, your family members, even more than you possibly could. Are you holding on to any friendships or relationships that God may want you to relinquish? As Francis Havergal had to do with the case of that one suitor? Do you love God more than you love yourself? Do you seek his interests, his reputation, and his pleasure above your own? Well, in that last line, she says, take myself. That's how she started out. Take my life, Lord. And then she went through all these different parts of what she was consecrating up to the Lord. And then she ends where she started. Take myself. And I will be ever only all for thee. In fact, one of Francis's um, little books is called Kept for the Master's Use. It's an expression of her heart to be fully consecrated, devoted to the Lord. There's any part of yourself, your plans, your relationships, your possessions, your emotions, your career, your past, your future, that you are knowingly holding back from God. Have you settled the issue that the ultimate purpose of your life is to please God and bring Him glory? Is it the intent of your heart, by God's grace, to live the rest of your life wholly for Him and for His pleasure rather than for yourself and your pleasure Throughout the course of her life, Frances often reviewed these words as a means of renewing her own personal consecration to the Lord. And I would encourage you to get a hold of that PDF that we have available at reviverhearts.com. Print it out, maybe fold it and stick it in your Bible and just kind of review through the, the lines, the couplets of this hymn and these questions. So you can just be asking yourself, is my life fully consecrated to the Lord? There must be full surrender before there can be full blessedness, she said. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Trust your life to Him. He is worthy. He can keep your life. He can hold it. He can safeguard it. You hold on to your life, you'll lose it. You lay it down, you give it up to Christ, you will gain back that and so much more. As the Apostle Paul said, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That's what worship is. It's not singing songs, ultimately. It's saying, take my life, Lord, and let it be consecrated to you. That's our true worship. Present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Take my life, Lord, and let it be consecrated to you. Well, I hope you appreciate that hymn in a whole new way after hearing today's teaching from Nancy Damas Walgamuth. She showed us the background to the hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be. And she asked a series of questions about how the words of that song apply to our lives. You can download a PDF version of those questions at a link in the transcript of this program at Revive Our Hearts. The version of that song we just heard is from Nancy's piano album called Be Still. The purpose of the album is to point your heart to the Lord's peace. 
Nancy truly hopes your soul will be still before the Lord as you listen. We'd like to get you a copy of this album as our way of saying thanks when you donate any amount to Revive Our Hearts. You can download the songs or we have a limited number of CDs available too. Your gift will help this program continue each weekday and it helps us minister in various languages around the world. The outreaches of Revive Our Hearts, they're possible because of listeners like you. When you call with your donation, ask for Nancy's piano album, Be Still. The number is 1-800-569-5959 or look for this offer at reviveourhearts.com. Again, it's reviveourhearts.com or 1-800-569-5959. Tomorrow, we'll hear about a hymn writer who watched her husband die as he tried to save a drowning child. I think you'll recognize the hymn she wrote after this horrible tragedy. Nancy will tell us more about it tomorrow on Revive Our Hearts. This program is a listener-supported production of Revive Our Hearts in Niles, Michigan, calling women to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.